Rock the Ripple. Rock the Ripple. The Rock the Ripple Podcast with Narita McInnes. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Rock the Ripple podcast. I'm your host, Narita McInnes. It is so awesome to be here with you as always. And as always, today is another very exciting day because I am joined by another very special guest. She is a mother, a storyteller, a solution finder, a self-confessed private law geek, and the founder of the Sovereign Lighthouse, if I can get my words out, (laughs) and so much more. She is the one and only beautiful inside and out, Sky Marissa Rose. Sky, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Thanks so much for having me here. I've, um, I've been super amped to come and connect in this space ever since we caught up at the festival. It was, yeah, really, really exciting proposition to get in this space with you. So thank you. Yeah, oh, it's so cool to be with you, Sky. You're an absolute bloody champion and I absolutely loved hanging out with you and connecting with you at the festival as well too. So for people who might not know, um, Sky and I connected at the Living Free Festival um, in Pillar, Pillar Valley, Pillar Valley, depending on where you come from, <laughs> um, just a little while back and uh, we just had so much fun. And this woman on the screen, I tell you what, she is just a powerhouse. She just, she she knows a lot. She is just a, a a beautiful, big-hearted woman and soul, and I'm just so grateful that she's here. So perhaps uh, at the start of every podcast, Sky, as you would probably know, we just sort of chinwag a bit about um, who you are and, and what you do and all that sort of stuff. I know I gave you a bit of an intro, but if you want to just take it away uh, for the masses. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I guess the the way I describe myself to people to try to summarise it is a, a jack of a few trades, master of not much. I've <laughs> I've just done lots of bits and pieces really, but um, to keep it in a nutshell, um, I was raised on a farm with, um, I've got only brothers, no sisters, and um, raised on the land, um, fourth, fifth generation farming family. So my grandfather, great-grandfather, even my father helped um, clear the land. I won't get into that topic of conversation, but um, that was my my upbringing. And so um, I guess when I reflect on that, um, there was a huge amount of freedom that came with that, like just comparatively to now unadulterated freedom and also I would I would say I was very sheltered because you know I I spent a lot of time in nature we were you know with nature and in nature and um I got shipped off to boarding school uh in year eight and so I was really sheltered when I came to the city my experience of the big wide world was (laughs) pretty limited and so uh I guess that was the start of a big shift for me um really learning how to fit in and I wouldn't say learning it was more like being forced to fit in and then once you're forced to fit in you just try to do the things or I was just trying to do the things then to work out how we did life because I guess growing up I figured I knew what life looked like at least in in relation to nature and then all of a sudden you're like no it doesn't look like that and we do this and now society says we do this and now we do this and so that was the path that I took. Um, so I went on to university. Um, I'm just, I, every time I get with someone, like I, I said it at the festival, like with Dave or with you, Narita, I feel like this is going to be the confessional as well. Um, but I think there's a big need for um, authenticity and, and real stories. That's what I love about um, storytelling. So I'll tell you. So I, I was um, dating a guy at uni and we were together for three years and, um, you know, we were very in love at the time, I think. And, uh, he talked about getting married and uh, I was like, no, I want to go off and be a foreign correspondent, you know, for the ABC reporting like Sally Sarah from war-torn Johannesburg and I'm not ready for that kind of thing but um, but I fell pregnant with my first daughter uh, at university. Um, so that was an interesting story because um, a lot of people, that was my first uh, big experience with shame and being told that you couldn't do things in life mm-hmm. Um because of everyone else's perceptions or lenses. Um, that was probably my first big overcoming in life because I, I'm pretty wooden headed. And so um, because I got told I couldn't have a baby and finish uni, I was like, well, you know, hold my beer and watch me. Yeah. Um, and then I went, I was offered a job. Um, so I, before I had my daughter, I'd gone off and done some experience with the ABC so after I had her and finished my degree, I was invited to take up a role in the southwest of WA um, as a rural reporter. So I spent several years um, in journalism, doing a lot of colour, a lot of agri-politics, 
I went up to the Northern Territory and um, took up a senior reporter role in Catherine, um, met my black hat wearing, guitar plucking, country music singing husband, <laughs> got married, <laughs> had two more kids. Um, and then because I had the kids at that point, I decided to become an early years teacher. So I was really fortunate to teach and to learn more about the mainstream education system. Um, but in particular, I had the chance to work with um, First Nations communities in the Northern Territory, which was really, really amazing experience. And I learned so much, just, um, yeah, epic stories out of that time. Um, a lot of humbling and, and revelation for me through that period too. Um, I got divorced. Um, so if any of your listeners have been through that, uh, it was a pretty hairy situation. And that was um, probably the time when I, I started to sense that law was going to become <laughs> a thing because for me, because I'd had certain experiences in the lead up to this where law was for a very sheltered um, girl. Uh, I'd had these dalliances with the courts quite early on um, in these quite bizarre experiences. So it was like, mm, this is interesting and I'm not sure why this is happening. But um, after that divorce, uh, I guess you could say I, I wasn't feeling very uh, safe in the world. And so I was like, well, I'll just become a lawyer and that way I can handle myself and no one can touch me and yada, yada. So um, I have a lot of compassion for that girl, but that's what she did. She came down and she started a law degree and it was very short lived uh, because my father at the time through that experience and helping me through that, um, he had woken up to the fact that there was this whole private side of the ledger um, through common law. So he was on a deep dive of learning. And so then I'm doing this legal law degree at university and he's <laughs> researching private law. And every time I came to him with a legal concept, he'd blow it out of the water with a lawful concept. So in in my body, um, studying the legal system and law, albeit that it was a very short time, it just didn't feel right and it didn't feel like it was in goodness. Um, so I deferred because I didn't really, I wasn't really awake at that time uh, or what you might consider awake. So I parked that and I just kind of carried on with life, um, took on a position in our family business as the operations manager in uh, the Pilbara of Western Australia. So I was dealing with, it was logistics and I was dealing with um, the maritime industry because we were predominantly in, you know, um, resources, uh, shipping for resources like um, gas and iron ore. Mm. So I learned a lot about contracting actually because hell hath no fury like a Greek shipping captain and if he hasn't got his stores on time or something's gone wrong. Um, so that was an interesting experience actually and there was a lot of richness in that um, because I learned the power of um I guess, humbling myself in contracting, like in that particular culture, it's a real ball breaking culture. Um, it's very male dominated and men can kind of come in there and do certain things and <laughs> bust each other's chops. But if you're a woman coming into that space and you, you can't really go toe to toe with them. So I had to learn to really um, go into the skill of negotiation and going to peace and how can I make this right? How can I remedy this? Um, so that probably ignited um, more of my interest in the contracting piece because I found it all very fascinating. And then COVID hit during that time and um, I just all of a sudden layers of stuff were, were, were you know, the, the veil was just being pulled up at this rapid rate and I could barely hang on. It was like buckle up and hold on. And um it was really fortunate that we had, to me, that we had that lockdown time where I could sit with my kids and start to reflect and process um, what was actually happening because in the lead up to that as a body politic or as a collective, I feel like we just weren't maybe paying attention and all of a sudden we got sucker punched. Mm -hmm. And so that that shutdown time allowed me to sit and really observe what was happening and then I just got this raging fire in my belly because I have these kids sitting in front of me and I'm thinking, this is this is a slippery slope. And if I don't start to do something, then all the acquiescence of the body politic that got us to this point, it's it's going to be really hard for them to claw that back down the track. So I didn't really know how to take any action. Um but during that time, I came across a body of work doing a vaccine on consent. 
So I just dipped my toes in the water with that and I felt very naughty and very rogue, which was great. Um, <laughs> and then I, I kind of just kept moving from there and so um, just learned as much as I could about some trust work and um, the organisation that I work with now in Canada, um, Sovereign by Design, they were bringing forward a lot of great programs which led me into this particular trust work that I do now testing that out in Australia and just trying to help people find solutions to lawfully to create their own laws so that they're not subject to the laws, the only laws that we think are there because that's the the catch. We're taught that there's this one system and this is what it's, it looks like and this is how you move in it and it's all you've got. But we don't realise this potent ability we have to create our own laws which can then supersede um, or counter at least some of those laws that are running on the public side. So yeah, done a bit of everything and nothing at all also. Like it's just sometimes I feel like, you know, but it's all been moving on this um, amazing trajectory of change both without in terms of my physical reality, but also within in terms of how I feel safe in the world, how I feel safe in my body. Um, and then hopefully, you know, moving out of the sense of safety into creation and expansion and all of these beautiful concepts that I just feel like maybe we don't scratch the surface of as a collective. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so beautifully said. And I just, I loved what you said when you were um, explaining part of your life as well, the, the compassion that you have for the older part of you that, you know, um, because I know that there's all of us have these parts of us that don't exist anymore, but they're so vital for, for our journey and to be doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. And you sort of telling that story and sort of saying, oh, you know, I've done a bit of this and that and everything, but it, you can already see how it's all sort of aligning to sort of where you're heading. And then the beautiful thing about us being able to tap into um, who we really are because it all starts within. And so this whole sovereignty thing, that has to begin there. So it doesn't matter sort of what's happening out there, does it, when uh, we need to feel safe in our body and to to then, like you said, be able to create because once we've got that foundation, well, the world's our oyster, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's having, like what I'm seeing in my walk is just yesterday I got this <laughs> massive like, you know, whether people want to call it a download or Holy Spirit, I was driving home and and because recently I had an experience where a lawyer tried to shame me quite publicly. So he he found out that I had been speaking at the festival, never mind that it was under a, a private members association shebang. Like that whole thing we did was in a private setting. And this is a really key piece. It was in a private setting by private agreement. But he tried to bring a claim that I was out there publicly teaching different wow. things. And he tried to shame me by calling me a sovereign citizen. And it was really interesting because one of the threads through all of my experiences, my big key milestone experiences in life has been shame and guilt and gaslighting. I've had a lot of it. And at the time you, you feel like I had a you know, for a long time, I had a victim mentality around it because it's like, why is this happening to me? Why? And this feeling of powerlessness when I was being gaslit of knowing the truth and then this confusion. And so, you know, it just recently this experience happened with the lawyer and he calls me a sovereign citizen and, and there was no hook. There was no thing in me that took the bait. And then it didn't, I hadn't really integrated this experience. I was just like, I kind of laughed at it because, you know, as many of your listeners will know, sovereign citizens an oxymoron. You can't be sovereign and a citizen. The two words don't work together. Mm. So I had a bit of a, a giggle at the time. But then as I was driving home yesterday, it just hit me. Holy Spirit was like, do you see now why you had to walk through all that shame? Mm. Because now you can't have that weaponized against you. So all of these things um, that happen to us and around us, what I'm seeing is that, you know, I've seen them as things that have happened to me. But now I'm like, oh, as ugly as that is to look at, that was happening for me. It was happening for me to come into this space where I could experience something like that and have only grace and have only you know, a sense of humor almost about it. And so that's that part of that big shift and and the wisdom that comes with these experiences like 
you know, sometimes we just want to, I, I, the, what the, the kind of the visual I have for it is like, you know, I always pray, pray and say, you know, I, I want to get better at not getting caught in the swell. Help me ride the wave and not get caught in the swell. There's a difference. Mm. And that's what I'm starting to experience is that, um, we get so stuck in the experience or we are so in it that we don't realize this gift, this powerful gift that's being offered to us, <laughs> like it's stuck in the mud and it's normal. Like that's okay to be in there. Like I go in there. But now I can say to myself, you know what, I know something really good is coming through this experience. And that's that. there's a real joy to that for me at this point. Mm. I can really relate to what you're saying there because it's so true. And like, I know I've had my fair share of shame, guilt, like gaslighting, all those kind of things. And when you're not aware and you're stuck in it, like you said, it can be so debilitating as well. But to get to that point, isn't it just so beautiful when you can just go, oh, and laugh about it and just go and and see how far you've come. And that's, and that again is the compassion for that person. And I, I totally a thousand percent agree with you. It's happening for you. And sometimes in the time, it's not going to feel like that's going to feel shitty and gross, not sexy, horrible. Um, Definitely not it, sexy. <laughs> not sexy. Definitely not sexy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's all there for us. And then, you know, and it, it, it you know, the beauty of hindsight's great, but it's strength strengthening us as well, isn't it? It's strengthening our inner strength and our knowing of who we are um, and how powerful we are as well, don't you think? Oh, totally. And that was one of the things that I loved um, in our conversation by the water there where um, I forget what how we got into the chat actually, but we were just, mm-hmm. you know, you know, mulling things over. And then I talked about, you know, as a kid, because um, I'm just learning now to mm-hmm. to really feel into my body, to think the things, but to really go try to go into there. And I have a real resistance to it going into my body to feel the stuff. I'm like, well, you know, because that's the ego thing of like, no, no, <laughs> just stay in the head, like you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but when I <clears throat> talk to you about, you know, my experience as a kid of being told constantly, you're too sensitive, Sky, you're oversensitive, you're sensitive, you're sensitive. And so I internalized that as if there was something wrong with me. And so then I look back on my life and I'm like, all of the things, all of the choices that I made were about proving to people that I was not sensitive. And how bizarre is that? Because that sensitivity was the gift. That's part of my gift. And we all have that gift. And we're taught to do anything but tap into it. It's just like wow, you know, what a fib, what a lie to society and and what a lie that we tell our kids. And, you know, when I look back on my experience of teaching, um, people have often said, why don't you teach? Why don't you teach? And I'm like, because <laughs> I now have a moral and ethical dilemma with the construction of classrooms, with the construction of the curriculum, but also too, the way that we're herding these kids down like, basically a, a sheep yard and a sheep race. And mm-hmm wondering why they come out traumatized (laughs) you know it's just like I don't know how to shift that system yet so but I'm not going to be a part of it in that way I'd rather move towards things you know relating to homeschooling and things where we can teach kids to really dial into that um yeah it was interesting that you had relayed your experience with that and then all of a sudden you start to see that there's probably a lot of us that have had these experiences right Absolutely. Absolutely. That was one of the biggest things that I was often told. You're too sensitive, like, you know, um, just, you know, put a smile on your face and kind of just get on with it. Um, But, you know, our emotions and our sensitivity, like you said, they're our gift and that's what makes us who we are. And it it also allows us to tap into our intuition and, and to all of those things. So when you're having those things squash in your personality and just you're you're learning, okay, don't be like how I actually am. Let's just try and fit into a box so that I fit in. And that's that's not cool. And like you're talking about as well, like with kids and at school and stuff like that. When you said that, I was remembering having a coffee with some friends opposite a school um, at, uh, a while back. And I remember just um, looking at it and I just thought there's all these like fences and everything was just all boxed in and then there's the siren from when you're allowed to play and when you're not allowed to play and it was just sort of just that thing you're like it reminded me of a prison 
Um, and I just, because that's the same sort of thing that would happen. They've got the same sort of fences up and then they've got the, the sound for when they're allowed to go out. And I was just like, wow. Um, but yeah, just like coming back to, um, sensitivity in the kids as well. Like when that's beaten out of you, when, um, it's, it's a big thing, but when you like what you said as well before, it's, well, it's happening for us because now we know that that is such a huge gift and it isn't something to be ashamed of. And for us to be able to walk around and know this and to be able to just embody it, even if we don't say anything, that ripples out. And to me, that is a beautiful gift in itself, don't you think? Oh, totally. And just like to the point about the sensitivity with kids, I mean, that that's such a doozy because before you even look at sensitivity, there's such an overriding of their body, right? They have to mm. put their hand up and ask to go to the toilet. Their body says, I need to go to the toilet. And you have to ask permission to do mm. so- something as natural and fundamental as go to, go to the bathroom. And then people will say, well, you know, you have to like come down on the kids because they'll just be running to the bathroom every five minutes. My question is, well, what, do you, what are we doing in classroom that would make a kid want to avoid it? right? Like kids love to play. Kids love to be sociable. So what is so horrible about the classroom that they'd rather be sitting in a dunny? Like, yes. have a look at that. Let's explore that. You know, I think there could be some some value there. Um, but you're so right in what you say in the ripple effect um, because what I notice is when I was out of my, like I'm just going to call it out of honesty, not even authenticity, but out of honesty, because to be inauthentic to me is to be dishonest mm-hmm. about who I am. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a conscious dishonesty. It's a, it's maybe a dishonesty through preservation, but it's a dishonesty. And so if I'm in dishonesty about who I am, then there's like this, this kind of abrasion that's going on because el- energetically what I think, I don't know, but what I think energetically or what I perceive is that if I'm going to a group of people and I'm projecting one way, but I'm not that way and I'm in dishonesty, they can pick it up. Yeah. So I got bullied a bit at school over certain things. I think a lot of people have had that experience. Yeah. And so it was like this compounding effect because then I try harder and I tried harder. And the dishonesty that I was putting out into the earth was causing that abrasion. Mm. <laughs> um, and so now that I'm learning how to feel safe enough to come into honesty about who I am, trust me, there's things going off everywhere. People are like, we don't know you anymore. We don't really <laughs> know we like this version of you. Could you just go back to being that all-encompassing, people-pleasing, sorry-saying girl that we liked earlier because we got a lot more done that way, <laughs> you know, so it's all like that. But this honesty that I'm coming in with now is lighting my heart up, but I'm also finding people who want that honesty. Mm. So that's the that's the ripple effect and that's the mirror. And so to be at that festival with everyone, it was astounding for me because, you know, we were there um, together with an amazing crowd and to see everyone cheering each other on. Like I've not been in a space like that where people are cheering to your face and behind your back, <laughs> yeah. you know, sometimes we're in a space and people are tuned to your face and then behind your back, they're like, <laughs> you know, yeah. like I've had a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and so in in that particular, you know, area, I just felt like there was this coming together of like-minded people craving honesty and craving authenticity and welcoming it. And um, it was really illuminated to me when, uh, I forget which day it was, but I started getting unwell, feeling unwell. And I'm sitting down on the lawn and Alex Zep comes up and he's like, um, Sky, you know, because he'd just been sick before that. So he was feeling it. He said, look, I'm going to go get you a cup of bone broth. And I said, no, no, like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Because I felt like I was supposed to be taking care of them, you know. Mm. And then he says to me, point blank, he says, you need to sit down and learn how to receive, right? I'm going to get you the bone broth. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> what a man, how lucky is his wife, right? Like yeah. what a shock of masculinity right there. Sit down, I'm going to do the thing. I'm like, leadership, there we go. Yeah. But his honesty in telling me it's okay to say yes and to receive, I was like, I feel like this is the kind of way we were supposed to move through life with just this open-heartedness of, you know, sharing and reciprocality and 
you know, it, it was just little things like that really landed with me. Um, so that was a very special space. And that's, I want more of that now. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I've got a mini addiction. I'm like, more, more, more. <laughs> yeah. It was so addictive, actually. It was, and it was just, it was so freeing, like, <laughs> um, and just to have like the, the energy of just exactly what you said, like of people just cheering each other on, everyone just being their, themselves, like, oh, I'm a massive goober. People got to see that, <laughs> you know, like just the authenticity okay. and the realness, but the love and just genuine, like there was no, I don't know, whatever that, that ickiness is. It was just so, beautiful really um and to have that support and I remember you saying about that about Alec and it was just so beautiful and I could see how powerful that moment was but on so many levels for all the things that you just said um and I think that's sort of exactly where we're heading to is we're supporting each other and cheering each other on and being ourselves and allowing our everyone to be who they are um, that unique piece of the puzzle because none of us are here to be the carbon copy. None of us are here. Like we genuinely want people to do well and that's what's so beautiful is about having like all these people come together when they thought it was going to be smaller and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. It just shows how many people are out there with these big hearts and wanting to see humanity thrive and wanting to see the best for everyone. And I feel like as we sort of strip back and like you were saying before about people saying, Sky, go back to that version of yourself. Like, because, and that's the thing though, like what actually happens too. And I've noticed it in my own life too, is you, you do, you evolve and change and grow. And then other people aren't sure where you're at and so it, it feels different and, and that's because you're shifting frequencies literally um and I think that that's something that you know it take, takes courage as well to do this sort of thing don't you think oh a hundred percent it takes courage because I mean like we you know we touched on the whole reason that we shut down that honest part of ourselves that authentic part is because mm -hmm. it's not safe we get feedback from our environment and from our surroundings that it's not safe to be that way mm -hmm. and so you shut it down and you shut it down and you shut it down and then you just for me I ended up to the point where I didn't really I didn't know who I was and if the whole purpose of life is to really know thyself I just felt so far away from it. Like when I got divorced, this is so silly, but I laugh at it because it's funny to me that I, I was so far from knowing who I was. I thought, how, how am I going to work out who I am? I thought, I started with very practical things. I thought, okay, well, I'll just start small and I'll work out how I like my eggs. Do I, do I like them poached? Do I like them scrambled? Do I like this? I'll go try it. I did art classes. I did all these things to try to get a sense of what I liked and what I wanted outside of what anybody told me. Mm. And I felt a bit ridiculous doing it, but I thought <laughs> there's really no other way to get back on tangent other than a process of elimination. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that that's what started it for me was this idea that it's not safe to be um, – who who I might be and it's not safe as a woman to speak my needs I don't want to be demanding I don't want to be a a squeaky wheel you know like we like women who are very accommodating and that's what society says and so um I had a lot of that to to try to work through and you know people aren't <laughs> people aren't saying to me this guy go back to who you are they're not verbalizing mm, it's no. the behavior when I start to really come into that honesty that reflects it but there's also like an invitation for me too, because what I see in that is that if it's very, if it's potentially challenging for someone to meet me where I'm at, then how much safety do I need to create to meet someone where they're at? Because that's the equity thing too, right? We want to be received where we're at in this moment. How do I receive others where they're at in this moment? So there's huge amounts of learning of, you know, potential learning for compassion and that kind of grace. Because, you know, too, I've been judgmental in my life. I've judged people harshly and I could never really work out why. <laughs> I used to just blame my star sign. I'm like, you know, it's it was sort of like meme on Facebook. It's like, you know, when people blame their star sign and they're like, no, Susan, you're just an a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was kind of that person. I'm like, oh, it's not my fault. I'm a Virgo. I'll just judge away. But yeah. <laughs> the truth was I was... You can only judge someone to the extent that you judge or persecute yourself and you can only condemn someone to the point that you condemn yourself. And I realized that all these things that I was doing 
were because I didn't feel safe to be honest. And so the only thing I could do to claw back was to to judge. In my own mind, I would never like put those things out, mm. but in my mind I'd be like, ooh, you know, and that's the that's the learning for me and the reflection for me is that when we come in that way, that we come with honesty and when we can receive honesty from others, there's no need to judge. Mm. It just all can be and then everyone can come into that safety. So the safety needs to be exercised, but it also needs to be built and created by each of us. And that's what I thought was so beautiful, you know, in that space and the courage for Alec to say, <laughs> you know, you need to sit down because, you know, we worry about offending others. We worry about poking each other's feelings. And that's, again, that safety piece. And I don't want to say this, but really he, he in a platonic love mm. as his brother, he's, yeah. he's giving me permission to let myself off the hook and that was what was so beautiful about it is if we can be more honest and give each other permission to bring more of that I think is really where I'm desiring to go yeah yeah and you and from that very moment you will never think the same again you you do you know what I mean like it was such a a catalyst moment for you to be able to go oh wow actually thank you Thank you so much. I needed to hear that. It's exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. And now you will live your life differently because of a, a, not, a, not even a 10-second sentence. You know what I mean? And that's the power in it, isn't it? Yeah, that's the the tweak. It's just mm. one person like giving you that, that wanting you to be the best version of yourself. That's what the intention behind that was. He was like, no, no, you can have this, you, you know, and that that's what the baseline should be for each of us is to you know be moving through with that kind of thing and and so you know when I look at why it's not like that it brings me back to law because when I look at the public I just call it the public and the private but when we look at that public system it's designed to have us you know, arguing with each other like that concept of insurance is all about finger pointing and blame it's all about the the indoctrination that we get from those early years is all about suppression of who we are and becoming more of what the system wants us to be mm. so that we make them money, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right? Servitude. And so this other side is all about, you know, equity and coming together in agreement and raising each other up and wanting everyone to thrive. Whereas like in the public side, you've got these you know, kind of corporations sucking the life out of everything and the finances out of everything. This side is about putting, you know, it's a different energy. And so I guess that's really at the heart of it. You know, I think that the law is on my heart, but I mean, I geek out over it for sure. I find it fascinating. <laughs> but I love I that. <laughs> behind it, it's more about what the law can do for us in terms of who we were meant to be. And what we were meant to be. And I genuinely believe that our creator wanted us to thrive. Mm. The scriptures, irrespective of your take on the scriptures, indicate this. And if it was written by a bunch of Romans, well, even they're telling us, right? So, <laughs> so we we didn't come here to go through what we're going through is my take on it. Um, and, and, and I think that we possibly will never scratch the surface of truly our potential um, maybe some realized beings will, but <laughs> it's it's huge what we have to give and offer, and yeah, that excites me. Yeah, and I and I can see it, and I love it because I mean I'm the same. Like um, this this common thread that was felt throughout the the festival, but also just the people that were there. It is that feeling of wanting to see each other thrive, wanting to see humanity thrive. And I know with the work that I do, I've put in my frequency shift activation. I want to attract and work with people who um, feel just that. And 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 here I am being able to connect with such amazing, beautiful humans like yourself. And then, you know, for you to also bring it back to, to law and to be able to explain that to people so they get it in sort of layman's term. And I love that you geek out about it because it is so cool and exciting because we can and are and are absolutely um, shifting the way that we see how we can thrive in this world because it's not just one way. Just because that's how it's been doesn't mean that that's how it has to be for the future. 
And I'm sure that that's part of, um, like you said at the start, like seeing your children and wanting to create better for them. Like we, we are the catalyst change. We're the change makers for want of a better term, but um, there's a, a mission or a passion there, a fire in, in your belly, isn't there, just to want to do that. And everyone has their own parts. Like you do law, other people do other things. Like it's so important, but it's what we're here for, isn't it? hundred percent. And it all works together. You've got health and healing. You've got music as a medicine. Law is a medicine. These are all medicines that each of us bring to help people because, you know, the way I see it is that not everyone you know, we don't all heal the same way. We all have different needs in that way and different stories and different things that we're, you know, patterns, programs, bondages, shackles that we're trying to to move through. And so, um, you know, for some people it will be through music. For me, it's law and music. It's It can be lots of different things. Um, but but everyone has such a vital piece to bring um, in that way. I, I really see that and you know for me um I've got so I've got four kids and my my toddler came but also my son um who you met and to see him see that type of community that was the real highlight for me for him to meet some of the speakers some of the crowd that were there like he just knows now that there's a whole movement that has alternatives whereas my kids could go you know through this whole time and really not be aware Mm-hmm. And I don't try to force things on the kids. Like I try to tell them, I mean, during COVID, what I saw was that I was pretty vocal because I was like having my own epiphanies and I'd be like, oh my gosh, kids, like, guess what, FYI. They're like, whoa, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn to like, okay, you know, <laughs> because, you know, at a certain age, um, you can just incite fear. And mm-hmm. so, you know, what I say to the kids now is like, I'm working on things and the reason I'm doing it is this. And if, if you're ever interested and you want to know, I'm here and I would love to teach you because I want you to have options. But that's the invitation to them. I don't like ram stuff down their throat. I just don't think that's helpful for them. And I have seen in a lot of cases where it really turns the kids off, like they just c- kind of want to dial out. Um, yeah. They're in that path, like, you know, they're in that path, that right of that, that whole belonging thing is a rite of passage we kind of I think we kind of have to go through that they're kind of in that state but I just for me I want to keep the door open so it's like for for me growing up and you know maybe for a lot of others it's been like just this one way and so now let's open this door and if you choose to walk through it that's up to you but the 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 point for me as a mother my obligation and duty to be the very best steward of my kids that I can is to open that door and let them choose whether they walk through. And so that's what drives me because, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like, well, if I gave them options, that's something. And um, we can't ever decide for people, right? Like we just have to let them do their own path. But the more doors that we open for everybody, um, the more options we all have to find it, whether it's doors being opened in music, whether, I mean, you know, I just watched that <laughs> on stage with Jess and, and you know, when they got up and had a jam and it's like you just want everyone to feel that and to hear that. Um, so, yeah, that's what keeps me motivated is just um, doing better because, you know, if you look at the generations before, like I said, and the generations coming through, change can only happen because someone stops and says, something different needs to happen. Mm. And so I really credit my dad. I call him the kink in the family home. <laughs> he was <laughs> just like, <laughs> like this. And then I was like, okay. And so now the, the hose is flowing in a new way. And so, um, yeah, I just think that you have to make a conscious choice for change. Um, you have to make a conscious decision to, if you know better, to do better. Um, I had to. Um, and that's the shift. And so then there's that future generations may move down down that path. And they might not also, but again, what did I do in my time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I really like I I a thousand percent agree too. It's it's being able to open the door. Um, but you know, you no one likes to be told what to do either. Um, but we all go through those things. And what a gift uh, you as a mother, as a soul and and a human and 
just being here to, to recognize that and to be able to do that because I think it's that really comes down to walking your walk. And I think that that's where people will get to then, oh, I, she's doing it differently. Maybe I can look at that and, and do that. Um, and and ultimately it comes down to choice, like you said. I mean, that's one of our superpowers. We can choose whether we want to show up one way or we choose not to. And ultimately it's it's up to you and it's your responsibility, isn't it? It, it is, and I'll, I'll tell you an experience. So my my daughter, um, who's turning, uh, she's turned sixteen. She decided a year or so ago. So this is I'm just copping up to this as, as part of me having to let go and do my learning. Is you know she decided she wanted to go and, and live with her dad, and 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 in principle it was a great idea. But for some of the things that I was aware she wanted to do in life, I had some concerns and reservations about it. And she said to me, you know, Mum, I want to do this, and I said, look. I, I hear you and I think that that's something you should definitely do. I'm just not sure about the timeline. <laughs> and then I was like, it took me a while, I'll be honest. <laughs> but then I'm like, okay, Sky. so you want to raise kids who can think for themselves and tap into what they need and want and speak their needs. How you going there, big girl? I was like, oh, very good. <laughs> Went back, rang her dad. I was like, okay, are you? It's time. To go. <laughs> because it's that thing, right? Like I can't. That's that's the really big shift that I want for the kids is is my template of of parenting was to tell kids what to do. Um, no disrespect to my parents, it's just mm. most parents are carrying on a a, temp, a parenting template because I feel like we we get raised until about you know around eighteen we go off into the big wide world and we kind of most times we might stop self development and then we go off and have kids and we're kind of just like eighteen year olds having kids. I mean I was nineteen but. I didn't really do anything much to shift my parenting template. <laughs> and what I find is the kids will do it for you. Mm. And there's something really beautiful about that. Um, they're, they're really fantastic teachers in that way, um, unfortunately for them. But so, you know, I had to look at that and be like, well, really, if I wanted someone to teach me how to listen to my body and how to know what was right for me or how to do these things, then I have to open these doors, those sorts of doors, <laughs> which as a mum, you're like, well, I'm happy to open these ones, but I'm not ready for these ones. <laughs> so I had to, <clears throat> I had to open that door and let her choose. And, you know, I was also aware too, that, you know, when girls go through a certain age, that being with their dads is really important. And so, um, the closeness that we're getting through our relationship, through having let her go and do that, and the choices that she's making um, is evidence to me that it's the right way to go. I'm not saying we, you know, um, don't care about the decisions that that our kids want to make, but, um, yeah, I think that's a really big point for consideration in terms of how we shift and how we change is that the things that we needed as kids learning how to give more of that to the future generations and without doing it in a way that accommodates a lot of victimhood because there's some of these things that can come through too like there's a really fine line there and I I don't have anything intelligent to say about walking it but it's um these are some of the things that I'm starting to yeah think about because if if they can get that part right earlier then a lot of these other things that we're trying to bring through for them are going to be natural progressions and they, they're going to walk through those other doors probably more easily, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that you said that. It's just like it is a really fine line and all of us are navigating it as we go. Like anyone who says they've got all the answers and they're nailing it all the time, like you know they're going to be full of shit because no one can be nailing it all the time. We're finding our way. We're thinking, okay, how do I handle this situation? Um, I haven't or haven't been in this frequency of myself before, so I I need to know. Well, what do I want? How do what do I need from this or what do I want to give from this? And sometimes you don't even know, do you? It's just sort of like this place of well, fuck, I don't know, um, um, or maybe I just need to sit with it for a bit. Do you find that too? Oh, totally. You know, I'm like my, so I've got, my oldest daughter's 22 and she's, you know, the, the first, the first kid often cops it the hardest, right? And I, mm. I say to her, I'm like, sweetie, you know, I, I was a baby raising a baby, right? Like I didn't even know how to put my own mask on, but I did the thing and I did the best that I could and no one gives you a, so I'm not trying to minimize anything. I'm actually trying to affirm that, yeah, you got the rough end of the deal, right? Because I'm, I'm starting to get better over time. But 
the, these are the big things is like you, you do your very best in any now moment, but society doesn't give us space to breathe, to put our mask on or to do this or that. They've got us in this grind, like this, this you know, tax paying grind. So we're in this double income society. Mm-hmm. We're trying to make ends meet. We're trying to raise families. Like that's why I just described to people, I'm like, guys, I'm a hot mess. Like <laughs> I don't have it all together. I don't. I make mistakes all the time. I sometimes am so deep and thick in the mud of my own crap and I just know I've got to work through it. <laughs> but the point is I'm looking at it, right? And the point is that we can say to our kids, look, we we don't have all the answers. I didn't have the answers at the time. How can I support you now? It's it's the the parenting deal is the hardest part of it. I think I'll be honest with you in in that way because they do um you know illuminate so much, but um there's so much richness in that as well. Um so yeah, I think more of these honest conversations where we can say, I don't have it all together and tell me about the situation without going into that victimhood because you know, as I said at the festival, <laughs> I, I had big stories around victimhood. You know, I um, no one can w- lick their wounds better than me is what I say. Um, you know, I was pretty good at it and I was getting a really good, like I didn't have to do a lot of growing or a lot of changing when I sat there and licked my wounds. It was just like, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Why is my reality reflecting the same stuff back? And that's the boogeyman. That's the the part that we have to get to where it's like, okay, well, I am my problem. And I am my solution. And that's a hard thing to conceptualize when you feel like people have done things to you. But if you walk it back, it's usually like in my case, it was like, well, those things actually happened because I had poor boundaries or I couldn't speak my needs or I wasn't drum roll listening to my body. My body said, get the hell out of Dodge, <laughs> you know, and my brain went, no, 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 you'll be fine. And then the universe just won't smacks you one and you go, oh my gosh, woe is me. It's like, so I had to get to this point where I was like, okay, I, if I take back control and, and realize that I am my problem and I am my solution, now I can do something. That victimhood was very debilitating for me. Mm-hmm. It just kept me so stuck. Yeah. And I've been through some pretty yucky things probably not worse than others, definitely worse than some others. It's not a comparison game, but Mm. everyone's trauma is relative. Mm. And these are pretty yucky things. And, you know, some people might say, well, I'm a survivor and I'm this and I'm this. And I, I don't mean any disrespect to someone who views themselves in that way, who has survived or been through something. Mm. But for me alone, like I'm not projecting or speaking to anyone else, but just for me, I knew if I kept that story in my mind, that I would not grow and I would not be able to do something better and different. And that's the really challenging sticky piece about victimhood is that if it can be hard to move out of it because it appears like there's an insensitivity when really to kick someone out of it takes a lot of love, a lot of tough, that's where they come, you know, this concept of tough love. I don't know if I really like that term, but it's more about honest love that I want you to come through this and come back into alignment with what it is you're meant to do here and you know all that you're you know meant to be and so you know coming back to the kids like you can sort of see in this like generation coming through there's a lot more focus on you know um the emotional side and the healing side and the trauma side and I think that's really good because it's opening up conversations but it's almost like a pendulum swing too where there can be a lot of it can move very quickly to that flat stick I'm a victim I can't do anything in life and so interesting polarities to be you know interacting with um yeah mm-hmm. and like you said at the end of the day you ca- all you can do is share your story and put your energy out there and hope that that has a ripple effect and that anyone that is in that phase or that stage can can take that energy and and run with it right like it might be the inspiration or the the catalyst to help them go well you know maybe it is worth looking at that boogeyman and seeing what's behind it Mm, yeah I I really I couldn't agree more it's just like that that is the powerful stuff and like you mentioned the pendulum swing too like we can go so far one way and so far the other way and I also think that that can be 
necessary part of the journey for all of us. Like, you know, like I know for me, I went, my ass was so high up in the air, diving down so many rabbit holes and things like that. And because, it, you know, it's exciting and, you know, you want to find out more and more, but you've got to come back into a balance. Otherwise, you know, but it did serve a purpose as well. So um, I think that comes into it as well. And just like, just as I'm talking through, just like the compa- word compassion comes back into, like we we are in a time where so much light is being shed on so many things, but what it's really highlighting is um, the light and the uh, and the darkness within ourselves for us to look at. And I love that you, you know, you, you're so honest and just so um, authentically you and just saying, you know, I don't have all my shit together and, and I'm with you. I don't have all my shit together too, but we're doing the best that we can and we want to see everyone else do the best that they can. And that's what's, that's not what's so beautiful about just having these conversations like, oh, I'm not alone, but there's no rules or roadmap here we're creating it as well and so I think that you know when we do that and we tap into our heart and we tap into into that knowing and like you said as well feel feel our body listen to our body because I I mean we we shut it off we shut off listening to our body because like we you know so and also not being in that victimhood about it um you know you can be victims of things um things some shitty things can happen and that are out of your control. Uh, but ultimately it, it's up to us. It's our responsibility to say, okay, well, how am I going to show up now? What am I going to, um, what am I going to do from here? Like, am I going to stay there? But that doesn't mean you don't give yourself love and and th- give your inner child the love that it needs, but you bring that to the next part of your life, don't you? Is that yeah, sort of, yeah. you do. You do. I'll tell you about, I'll tell you a story about someone who nailed this. This is uh, my daughter's godmother and she was a year younger than me. So I was 20 by the time I had my eldest daughter and, um, I had this jilted Jerry Springer story. So, you know, her dad had hooked up with my best mate and I didn't realize this had been going on for a while. So it was a proper Jerry Springer story, right? We can have a laugh about it. We were young, <laughs> yeah. right? He's a great guy. Um, but at the time it was like my first experience of betrayal. And um, I'll tell you the first woman who lovingly kicked me in the pants. Um, and I come back to this all the time in terms of how I want to be the most loving um, to people around me who might be struggling. Um, <laughs> we're walking along with the pram. So I'm 20, she's 19. And and I'm I'm walking along telling the story again. I'm like, oh, but they did this and rah, 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 rah. you know, it must have been like probably the sixty thousandth time I've told the story. And she says to me, she pulls up, we don't like about a five K walk, I think it was, and she pulls me up and she goes, Sky, I love you. You know I do. And she goes, I will listen to your shitty story another 50,000 times if that's what it takes, right? I'll do that for you. <laughs> she said, but I need to tell you, you're either gonna get bitter or you're going to get better. And she said, I hope it's the latter. Now, boy, did she wound me. It was just like a knife through the heart with a bit of vinegar and salt rubbed in, right? I was like, you bitch, you don't get it. <laughs> in my mind. I didn't say it to her. I just went, it was cold offense, right? But inside I'm like, how very dare you don't know you don't know you don't know so I think we were only on like two and a half k's I had to walk another two and a half k's with her and you could just cut the air with with a knife and I got home and it was like maybe three weeks it took me three weeks I was like I don't know if I'm going to talk to her again I just think she's so insensitive and blah 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 blah. three weeks later I rang her up and I said you know what thank you I said, thank you for loving me enough to tell me that I might have become a shit person if I didn't figure this out. And did it fix it? No, it didn't. But it brought awareness. It brought an awareness that my whole life, because I just looked down the line, I'm 43 now, and I saw myself, I thought I was, you know, as a 43-year-old, this old 40-something-year-old, I just saw myself being like, I had a visual of me with like wrinkles and scowly face and what I visualized I might look like if I could get this narrative going. Mm. And so for her at that age to serve that up to me in such a benevolent way, I was like, wow, that's, that's honest love. That's like, I love you enough that I want you to be better. And I got that learning at a very young age. And so the truth is it's probably really held me in good stead because that's the thing that I come back to is when I do get really stuck in something, she's in my mind, <laughs> right? You've got a choice now. Mm. Uh, 
but that there's a real knack to that. There's a real art to being able to carefully, you know, um, help people move through things that they're struggling with. And I don't profess to be as graceful as what she is, but that was a big, it's like when you can almost look down the timeline and you can see which way you would have gone. <laughs> so yeah. I, I have a lot of love in my heart for her for, yeah, that honesty. And um, I think in the right circumstances, that's what we're all trying to build is this place where we can give and receive honesty mm. um, and know that people's intention when they're serving it up comes from a place of benevolence and with our, you know, our very best um, intention. Mm. I'm yeah. so I'm so glad you shared that story because it's it's so powerful and it's such an I mean not only is it a gift to you um but it just it just paints the picture of how how we we got to show up and how these stories like just I mean like you said benevolent love honest love unconditional love like unconditional love doesn't mean giving all this, uh, you know, it's no conditions, <laughs> uh, obviously, but it's just, it's giving that from that heart space and, and saying the tough things. And that's true love. That is true love to me. And uh, I'm so with you. Like, I, I feel like at this time, it's, it is all about honesty. It's, and in order for us to see more of that, we've got to be honest with ourselves too. And it is, it's looking, well, am I being, am I going bitter here or am I getting better? Um, so and I can I can already know that people listening to this will just will just think that now. And even if they've heard it before or had something similar, it's just gonna spark that because and um, we are creating better. We're choosing to do that, aren't we? Yeah, and she really, you know, in these later years, like I've got a really good team around me now. Like I have I've chose I've picked a team. I've mm. picked a team. Yeah. I don't know if they like it or not, but I just <laughs> Um, and it's interesting because the people that are on my team, as in my my trust and you know confidants or mentors, they're all the people that I know will kick me in the ass if I'm out of line because we we get blindsided. You know, we we sometimes can't see our blind our blind spots. And so for me, um, in any interaction or exchange, like I make a lot of mistakes, um, and I, I don't always see things. And so I really like to go to people who will be like. Hey mate, you could do better, right? Mm. And this is maybe what you want to think about. And that's because I've learned that the people that will tell you, yeah, 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 yay, yeah, they're not necessarily the ones that will be like, but what about this? And that's that's where the growth is. And so I've kind of learned to to like that, not you know, to be friends with that dark side because mm. that's you know we don't learn when we're really doing well as much as when we have to look at something confronting or have a challenging conversation. I just see that that's where the richness is, which is almost like completely juxtaposed. Um, you know, and, and it's funny, like coming back to to judgment, it's funny what things will show you. Now we're really in the confessional. But, you know, so I, I had my eldest daughter at, at university and like I said this to someone recently, right, it's just how much, how funny humans can be. But um, so I had my daughter at uni, I got married and had two kids and then I repartnered thinking that this was my forever person and I had my youngest son. And and what I experience is that people can be very judgmental, both about how many kids you've got, about their age gaps, but also too the fact that you've had kids to you know, more than one father. So I just joke to people and I say, you know, I'm the kid, I'm the, I'm the girl with, you know, 40 kids to 30 dads. But um I kind of joke because it's a defensive mechanism because there's some shame for me around the judgment that I've received. Mm. And in my heart, I go to myself, well, what am I really guilty of? Like thinking that love was available to me, thinking that a partner and a family were available to me because I can tell you now, every time a, a kid was made, it was done in the space of what I thought was my forever person. And mm. every one of my four beautiful babies was made in love. Mm. And within the the space of a sacred union, it's just unfortunate for me they didn't work out. <laughs> but there's judgment there, and I feel the judgment in myself. And someone was saying to me recently, you know, well, it's it's okay because we know who you are. And I said, I know you do. You know my intention, but people don't, and so that's where the judgment comes in. And I said, I'll tell you what, I would judge me. And they said, What do you mean? And I said, Well. Years ago, when I was a kid on the farm, Channel 7 did a series on mothers with multiple children who would go and get the baby bonus. I watched, this is how damaging the media is. Mm. So I watched this article, right? 
And I'm thinking, oh, those women. <laughs> now I'm that woman. How funny is that? How funny is that, right? So I get to witness in myself my own judgment of myself. And so it's so when people are like, well, Sky, we know. And I'm like, no, because I'm her and she's me. And she's me and I'm her. You can't say that I'm not that way and they are just because you know me, you know? Like it was just a really interesting conversation to that illuminated to me how many how our judgments are sometimes not even our fault they're just implanted by our environment again and our subconscious runs with it or our conscious you know thinking mind runs with it I was like this is really funny (laughs) like really like yeah you've got to have a sense of humor about it yeah you do, don't you? You, you absolutely do. And I love this. St- you are such a brilliant storyteller, Sky. I just, I love so much about you. And that is one of them, just like how you relay and just share that. Because I mean, and ultimately, like we do judge ourselves and we, like it, it is about being really honest with yourself. And then when that, like you with your other story that you were sharing earlier, when that hook isn't there anymore, when the trigger's not there, when you, when you stop judging yourself at all for that, it you know you know you've you've stepped into that next level for want of a better term don't you like it's just okay it's showing me something here what do I need to look at do you feel that as well yeah definitely like I think I think the more the the thing that I would really want to share with with anybody is that that might be struggling with this or trying to work it out um is that the more you come into honesty the more you find the people who can receive you which breeds more honesty, which breeds more like, so which, which removes the hook. Because if you don't know that there's an entire group or if you don't know you have a tribe that are open and aware and can see this and can think beyond the judgments and perceptions, then you don't know that there's any other way. Again, it's another door, right? Like, you know, I I only know what it is to be judged by society because society has horrible stories. They have beautiful ones too let's not mm. throw out the baby but you know they have some really yucky ones that need to go really need to go. and that takes effort and impetus from all of us but then when you see that there's a whole group of people that have an openness and an awareness you're like well there's no hook because I only thought there was a hook because I thought this was my only option and I had to belong and I have to be okay with them but it's like no nah, man I'm gonna go hang out over here yeah. <laughs> and just be who I am because man I can breathe now I can breathe and that's what you were saying. Unconditional love is I accept you for who you are, where you're at. And, you know, most people that are in that space of that awareness, they, they have a story and they know what it is to overcome and to be put through the fire and to be doing all those things. And so that's really our tribe, right? Like mm. when we were at that festival, <laughs> there was like nobody there that would have raised an eyebrow if we were like, we're super sensitive. I mean, by the way, I think everyone is highly sensitive. It just yeah. depends on the degree that you've shut it down, down yeah. to accommodate, right? But I don't think it would have mattered really much about what was said in that space. Everyone was just like, yeah, man, cool. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it was just, it was just really, um, yeah, and, and I want I want more of that in the world. I want my kids to, you know, uh, let me change my language there. I, I will and intend more of that in the world for the kids. Mm. Yeah. 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 I will and intend that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do love how you said it's just like you can breathe. You can just breathe. You can let your guard down. Like not, not that you had the guard up, but it's just like there's no guards around if that makes oh, sense. I, yeah. <laughs> I've had my guard up. 100% mm. I had my guard up. Like one of the things that I loved um, was talking with you and and Erin and other women in the space about some of the terrible sister stories we have, mm. like, like the competition between women. And for me, it was really challenging because I only had brothers, so I only knew what it was to like basically punch on. And I was probably a bit of a tomboy, but I liked it because you caught the flogging and you knew where you stood. And it was just like. Whereas women and girls at the time, I could not understand the, there was a lot of innuendo, there was a lot of exclusion, there was a lot of mind games. And I'm like, I'm just not wired for this. I don't understand. And it was not so much what 
they were doing, it was my inability to comprehend or to move within it that really I found um, challenging. And this carried on and I go, <laughs> I've had, you know, experiences where, you know, girlfriends have not done kind things to me and this curiosity about why is this? Like why is it that someone needs to run me down to feel better? Because a lot of the time that was what it felt like and I learned to keep myself small and I learned to stay away and I learned to just try not to be seen because I didn't want to upset anyone or I didn't want to get a target on my back. Like this sounds great. I'm just speaking freely about what it actually felt like. I had, you know, girlfriends sleep with my boyfriend, like just stuff. And it's like, why is this? I don't understand. And it created stories of severe, I would say severe mistrust of women. Mm -hmm. And how sad is that, that sisters are really, we are so better together. We are so powerful together. And yet I just wanted to retreat. And so then I would get called a man's woman. Oh, she's a man's woman, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's a man's woman. Well, actually, I just kind of like hanging out with dudes because I know what it is to be around brothers and men are relatively safe because they're more direct and upfront. I just mm -hmm. found it easier to relate with men from that space but then I would get stories oh she's this she's that she's a such and such and I'm like I'll tell you when I was at university too right and I, I did get stories on the other side as well I, I was at university and I went with a friend of mine from high school and I would just walk down the hall hi hi I would just say hi to everybody and my friend comes down to to my bedroom it was a co-ed uni so he comes down to go sky um you know, I just thought I'd let you know that you should be careful how you say hi to people and just don't be too friendly because all the boys think that you like them. And I'm like, what? I say hi to the girls that way too. Like I don't understand. Mm. So I started walking down the hallways carrying my files with like resting bitch face and I just wouldn't look at anybody and I'd get into the auditorium, go straight back to my Like he comes down another couple of weeks later and he's like, Sky, um, what's wrong with you? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, everyone thinks you're really sour and sullen and you got resting bitch face. I said, Tim, you know what, mate? I can't win. If I'm smiling and I'm saying hi, I'm I'm a tart or I'm whatever. If I shut down, then I'm a bitch. Like really, how, how does one win? <laughs> right? Like how do I just do life here? Like things like this created a lot of confusion really on both sides, I guess you could say. But overall, I found it easier to relate with guys because they just were, you know, more upfront. So, you know, I think, I don't know if anyone else has these experiences, but it's just really interesting to me that so much of us is molded by these types of things. And so it's taking me years to unwind it all, right, to let it go. And that's where that honesty is really potent. And to be around men where you can be in a platonic space, there's no assumption and presumption of your intention because that's the thing too. Mm. Um, a lot of assumption and presumption. Um, I read a book actually recently that was recommended to me. I can't remember the name of it, sorry, but it was about women dealing with men. And it was speaking um, specifically to the church. And it was saying that women um, didn't want to like relate with men because there was so much shame cast. Like if if a woman spoke to a man or sought counsel for a man from a man, it was automatically assumed that there was some sort of thing going on. Mm -hmm. and, he, and they were saying how damaging it was because women often need men for counsel. They need men to go to to have certain conversations that men can provide to give, you know, um, sort of courage to. And, yes, yeah, so that was a really interesting book to read because this is all that system, all these stories, whether it's, you know, sister stories, whether it's men relating with women's stories, we have a lot of conjecture around these things that I just personally feel has to go. It's really kept me limited. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I love the way you tell stories. I'm so grateful that you're sharing them and I'm sure people can relate. I mean, I, I was that person too that would say hi to everyone in the hallway too, but I didn't have someone come up to me and say that. But, you, you know, like it's just, you know, I feel like when you were sharing that, you're just being yourself. You're just being your big hearted self and you're just saying good day to people like as you would. Like to me, that's just a normal thing, but to a lot of people it's not. And then it gets me thinking that, you know, obviously 
everyone is operating from their own patterns and programs and how they see the world. And so when they're coming up to you and sort of saying something, they're projecting onto you. And then it's that fine line again of self-awareness, but also like what's mine and what isn't mine as well. Do you, is that something that you're navigating to? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. That's a really big piece, probably the biggest piece of all. And it's a, it's a great point that you raise because the guy that told me this, like we'd been to, he, he was actually my, my kind of my first like high school boyfriend and we, we, we're still good buddies today. And, um, so he was like, in his mind, he was probably trying to have my back because I was just trying to make friends. I was new there. And so there was only a small cohort of girls and being an agricultural university, it was like male dominated. So he probably in his mind thought he was trying to help me because he had inside knowledge to what the boys were talking about and they're all like oh she's really but we think we she like no I'm just trying to make friends people (laughs) I'm new here and I want to make friends yeah and so you know um he in his mind he was probably trying to help me but it was 100% his baggage right and if the older me could go in there now I'd just be like your problem everybody because this is the this is what you boil it down to and what I'm trying to teach my kids is is it the truth just because someone says something, is it the truth? And I, I see how much energy I've put into my life believing what people have said or thought or behaved. It's like that's the ultimate acquiescence. If someone's going to say something about me, and this is a really hard thing, this has been a really hard thing for me to grasp because it's like I don't know if it goes against Maslow's hierarchy, whatever it is, that need to belong. Mm. It's like the truth, who determines truth? If I know my intention, then that's the truth. And you can't life, you can't run from your own intention, right? You can try to deny what your intention is, but you can't really run from it. But if you have like people saying stuff, we are programmed to go, oh no. But we don't sit back and go, well, is it the truth? Just because this many people, and I'll, t- I'll tell you another story that illuminated this to me. So in my divorce, which is pretty hairy, I had a lot of people saying things and it went into court documents. And I remember freaking out. I had to go see a psychologist and I had to go see a lawyer. And I said to the psychologist, I am so scared. I said, I'm in a community where one party is heavily entrenched. I don't have any people in my camp here because that's kind of how divorce things go. Mm. Not that I wanted to do it that way, but it tends to be a real side taking thing. Yeah. And I was like, there's no one in my camp. How can I stand? I don't have any witness. I don't have any witnesses to these things. And the things that were in there had no context. So anyway, it felt like David and Goliath. And again, this is why I had the experience is I learned that the truth doesn't require defending. Mm. And because this psychologist said it's like this, right? She goes, you can have all these people and they can say this and then she's like, there's you and there's this. Where does the truth sit? She actually drew me a picture and she basically said, look, the truth doesn't require defending and she goes, I can't qualify or quantify this for you but it will always come out. It will always be revealed. And I I really struggled with that answer but I went down to to the city to do my responding affidavit. Um, And in that affidavit, we were really unemotional. We put dates, facts, times, and lawyer had said to me the same thing. She said, Sky, the truth doesn't require defending. You're just going to tell your story. You're going to give credit where it's due because the court doesn't like to see people savaging each other, by the way. So you just tell your story and we'll put it out and then you will, you know, tell your truth. So we did that. And that was the thing that turned the tables. And after the event, there was a particular party that put an affidavit in that actually asked to ask, made an inquiry with the uh, plaintiff's lawyer to have that removed from the record, which is like saying, I perjured myself. Can I take back my affidavit? Right. Mm. So this one affidavit that went in of me telling the facts of what had occurred with dates, times, actual facts, not conjecture and you know, uh, projection, if you like, was enough to unravel all of that. So it was a very painful lesson, but it was also a very powerful one because I saw, I got to see in real time that if you state the truth, the truth is the truth and everything will move around that. 
And so it took a long time for me to integrate that experience because I still, the, the program that I'm running is still like, oh, someone said this, it's, it must be true. I've got to stop myself and go, hang on, is that true? Mm-hmm. Work it back because it's, it's just a layer to shed. But to your point, that's what we're taught to do. I mean, we have teachers telling us this to come back to school again. We have our parents, not their fault, telling us this. That's their projections. That's um, Some of the time what they're telling us is good and it's wisdom, but some of the time it's their fear and it's their story of what they haven't healed in their journey. And so, yeah, we, we have a lot put on to us and it's a real trick, I think, like a real knack to be able to work out what is mine and what is somebody else's. And I don't have anything intelligent to tell you about that, but because I'm still learning. Um, but I think it's feeling into the body and asking yourself, what was my intention? What am I doing? If I know that that's square, that I'm good and I carry on and I have to rise above, you know, I just have to keep rising above and trust that the noise will dissipate and the truth is louder if we stay silent in it and trust in it. Um, but that's a real challenge. For me, because we want to like run out and defend, defend, defend. And I've spent a lot of my life defending. I'll tell you what, it's exhausting. Mm. I'm done. You want to say something about me? Go nuts. I'm going to be over here. Yeah. <laughs> Chilling out on the lawn in the sunshine. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> you know, it's like the whole thing of the fuck it bucket, right? Like maybe yeah. it's just an age thing. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you're just going to get to the point where you're, um, you've got, there's no more room anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost there. Almost yeah. There. No, no more fucks to give. Like really just. <laughs> Yeah, that's your stuff that's your stuff and and maybe it's a mental thing where you say you know what you don't have to say it to people but maybe in your mind you're like mm, no that's yours I send that back to you or I send that back with love wherever it needs to go but it's not landing yeah I'm still learning how to do that yeah mm, yeah no I feel you on that and that's and you know you've said a couple of times I don't know if I've got anything intelligent to say but everything that you have shared today has just been phenomenal and it's because you're speaking from your heart and from truth and I really love that you shared that experience as well because that is the truth if you're if you know your intention and you know the truth like the truth will always be and and you know if you've you know if you've gone out and set an intention and and done something that's not quite you know you know that and people will know that and and the truth will always win doesn't mean it's going to look pretty all the time but it it is the it is the key isn't it it really is it is and that's why there's that old saying i mean i don't know where it came from but we're told you know the truth will set you free and mm. Um, and it's, I think the hardest part is, is the trust in that, is the faith in that, um, because we don't like to be in the unknown. If we feel, if we have icky feelings or if we have something come up, it's like, we want to address it. I want to, I want to deal with that, deal with it so I can close it and put it aside. We don't really like, I don't, I don't like, I've got to stop talking about, about we actually only speak to my experience, but I don't like to sit in the unknown. I find it icky and uncomfortable because my ego and my, my thinking brain can't predict Mm. So it's that thing of getting really, you know, reminding myself that, okay, the brain wants to get busy. It thinks this, this, and this should happen, but I've just got to go into the body. I've got to sit. I've got to breathe all the things that I don't like to do and, and just get comfortable with the uncomfortable, mm. right? It's getting, it's making uncomfortability your friend, my friend, and being like, oh, yeah, I see you feel gross, but hang out. It's fine as long as it takes. <laughs> we'll get there together, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the going into it. Whereas like, you know, probably my whole life I've tried to go around it, over it, maybe under it. So now I'm like, no, got to go through it and just try to hold myself. And I'm also getting more honest with my kids now. I'll be like, hey guys, I'm struggling to hold myself through something. So I'm I'm a bit bit vacuous if I'm not very (laughs) organized. Just know that I'm trying to put my mask on. And I think these things kind of help them too, because And hopefully that's modeling them how to speak um, to their needs because, you know, that's, that's probably, you know, I don't really have regrets. Like I said, I'm learning to love all of the parts of my story, even the the supremely traumatic parts. I see the gift, but with, if I did have one regret, it's that, or do have one regret, it's probably just that I haven't been present with my kids because I haven't known how to to be at times and then also you know you're working you're doing all the things and you think you're with them you're feeding them you're doing all the stuff but to really be present with them and then in the times when I haven't been able to be present to actually say them guys I'm not 
okay at the moment just for the time being. I'm working through some stuff and to be able to have those really raw conversations because um, what I notice about the kids coming through is they're super intuitive, like just as a general Every kid that I'm, you know, they are super dialed in. They're very aware and you can't lie to them. I mean, everything's got to be age appropriate and within reason, of course, but um, these kids are really tapped in. And so it's, they are leading, my kids are leading me to more of that honesty in that way as well, because I can see them physically. They'll be like, "Er," and and they'll be really, and as soon as I say to them, because I'm trying to pretend like everything's fine or Mm -hmm. something's fine. And then as soon as I say, guys, I'm not okay, or like, you know, I'm okay, but I'm just going through something, they relax. They're like, I knew it. I knew it. And I'm like, yeah, I know you did. That's why I told told you. You can't, you know, you can't lie to them. So, yeah. They're real. They are. They're really bringing up the frequency. And I think, I think them just being on the planet is helping us to do it even more and to be more. I mean, when you're sharing that and talking about how as a mother, you are able to do that. Like to me, that is such a massive, powerful gift because, and and it, it doesn't matter when you decided that you would start to start implementing this. It doesn't matter because the gift is there. And, um, and that's the beauty of truth as well and honesty. And, you know, I, I feel like that that is where we're heading and that, 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 like you said, the kids that are coming through now, like they are just, they've got that frequency of love. They've got that frequency of, um, being able to spot bullshit, bullshit. (laughs) Their bullshit radars are like. (laughs) They're like, okay, sure. And so like, we're either going with it or we're not, because that is where the world's heading, like without a doubt. Do you, you feel that, don't you? Oh, totally. And like sometimes I'll ask my kids, I'll be like, because cause their um their bullshit radar is not as like toned down as ours because we got all these more years of like that's the way I view it is like, yeah. you know, I had that same radar but I chose to ignore it. So now I've got to dial back in to really bring that connection through and that's, you know, what I'm working on. But these kids already have it and it hasn't really been, you know, beaten out of them yet if you by the system um so you know I really I do ask the kids I'm like what do you think about this they have a lot of wisdom so Mm -hmm. to me um you know it's because because what I what I want for my kids is 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 a new parenting template um something that they can build on that is is um going to benefit them and whatever they choose to do in life should they choose to have kids and so um yeah, create cultivating those conversations um, is really paramount. And because I think most parents would agree too that one of the things that we say is that I want my kid to be able to come and talk to me no matter what, no matter what it is. I want to think that I'm the kind of parent that can be there for it. But really, are we, you know, creating that space? And I can hand on heart tell you that in the past I haven't because I've been afraid to have certain conversations. I've felt like I again it's the same pattern playing out just with your kids so you know I was like oh I need to belong in the world I need to be seen in the world this way now I've got these children children offspring and um you know now I need to be perceived like this as a parent and then you got society bringing you back in too because you've got the Instagram moms (laughs) no offense to anyone doing Instagram stuff I think it's great Mm -hmm. but there can be this really um sort of superficial because you only see, I don't mean superficial because people are superficial, but superficial because you only see it through social media. Yes. This is what being a mum looks like. And, you know, and now we've got this thing about gentle parenting, which is amazing conceptually, but then also two kids need to learn no. And so mm. there's a, there. Yeah, so it's just everything in balance, but there's more pressure coming in. There's more on how to be a mum. There's more we should do this more. And I think that's why some of the best influences you see are just, owning the fact that they're shit shows and they don't know because most of us are like, you know, but I think the point is what are you trying to do? What is your intention and working towards that? Um, that's that's all I'm trying to do is to to be better than I was yesterday and open up more with them than I was yesterday. <laughs> I told my kids I'm like, for all of my unconsciousness as a parent, I'm really sorry. I can't fix that now. I'll help you with therapy if you need it (laughs) it's your job to undo that but that's the truth like I can't actually I'm sorry if I have caused the Mm. anything or these things or these things that bother you or worry you 
you have to fix that the same way I have to fix the things that I inherited. And I will help you with that. I'm here with and for you, but I can't do it for you. Mm. But I, you know, it's it's just an acknowledgement and and trying to have some honesty with them that <laughs> but I also know they're gonna get it because when they have their own kids, if they have their own kids, if they choose that. They'll get it then. They'll be like, oh, mom, I see you now. (laughs) (laughs) When they're in it, they're in it, right? And so I had all these grandiose ideas of what I'd be like as a mom too. Um, But then if you haven't unpacked these things, then the kids will unpack it for you. Mm. (laughs) It's like, you know, a big hammer. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, look at this thing you haven't looked at. (laughs) No gentle medicine there. Just there, yeah. So, but, you know, again, having a sense of humour about it and um, trying to keep it light so as to not create shame and guilt because mother guilt is is hardcore, right? Like um, questioning everything that we're doing. I could have done this better. Have they got enough? Like, so these are the kinds of things like that guilt and shame, again, is the thing that can, in my experience, cause us to close up and to be in fear and to not open that connection and to not be willing to have some of those challenging conversations. So that's all I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're, and Sky, you're just bloody amazing, um, actually. And I just think, you know, the fact that the intention is everything. And I think if if all of us, if nothing else, we just aim to be better tomorrow than we were or better today than we were yesterday like that's that's all we can do and just to be kind and compassionate to the different parts of ourselves when we didn't know any better because we can't know it all and we, a lot of us have got a lot of layers and stuff that we're we're removing and we can just only show up in the the best way we can in that moment and when we know better we do better um and that's our responsibility to do that so yeah it is, and and because that you know we're teaching them too, like as in you know, and it's that exchange, like I guess too, because we go, oh well, I d- made a mistake here and I did this, but we forget about the other parties in that exchange, what they're learning through our mistake or through our interaction or through that exchange. So, you know, I I think that like I say to the kids, well, <laughs> it's not to suggest that, but it's like everything that you know, because I. I I don't know about you, but like there's a phase that I think you can go through in early adulthood where you start to really, I judge my parents. I'm like, oh, they've done this, this, and this. And now, now I'm like, my parents are amazing. <laughs> but I went through this stage of like, oh, new, 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 new. And that was part of my victimhood piece, right? Um, because I just didn't want to look at the, the different things. And so I think sometimes maybe that could be. Um, a thing because you're you're trying to process this shift from childhood to adulthood and you're trying to make sense of your identity coming into your own as an adult. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that they've had that experience of like going through this phase where they were like really (laughs) down on their parents. Um, And I have open dialogue with my parents about it now because I'm like, I was really awful to you. And they're like, yeah, you were. And (laughs) <laughs> and they're like, but we get it. Like, and we and they've been able to talk about things that they went through in their parenting journey. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea. And then I have more compassion for them because I'm like, man, they were trying to give us all these things. And again, did they have their masks on? Right. Mm-hmm. Like they're, you know, in the airplane can't mm-hmm. put someone else's on until you put your own on. And and I and now I just have admiration for them that they could give us all the things that they gave us and, you know, do the things that they did for us, even if their mask wasn't on, right? So that's that healing and coming full circle. And that's why I think, well, you know, we just do our best and we'll all get it eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you doing this work as well, you're helping them too. Like it goes every way. Like it's not just to the kids, to the parents, like it goes every way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. And I'm I'm not really very well researched on the generations before and the ones behind, but I think there's this, you know, um, notion of seven before and seven ahead and how it's all kind of interlaid. And so I do feel in my heart that there is some healing that ripples through that whole lineage when we're doing it together as a family in this now moment. So yeah, there's a lot of beauty in it and taking time to stop and really revel in that, you know, and just revel in it when we can. Yeah. <laughs> right? Before we go back into the quagmire again and come yep. up with more revelation and beauty. It's just yeah. it's beautiful like that, right? It's beautiful. 
It yeah. is. I'm, I'm so with you. It is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's messy. It's fun. It's exciting. It's scary. It's like all the things. And we're here to experience it all. And uh, when we become aware that we're playing this game and we get to create and play how we want to play, then everything and have, bring that sense of humor, like you said, it just, it becomes a lot more freeing um, and just a lot more like, okay, what are we going to do next? Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I I think so. And the sense of humor is a big one for me. Like, I was always a fan of the um. Do you remember the movie Van Wilder, Party Liaison? Yeah, yeah. And he's, and he's like, um, what does he say? He goes, oh, don't take life too seriously. You'll never get out alive. Yeah. And I think that's such a great, you know, um, comment because one of the things that I do in my my real thinking mind is I I get really. It's like everything's you know oh it's this you know and it's like. Very a lot of seriousness, a lot of heaviness about things that really, when I look back now, if I'm going to have a going into the muck moment, at least now I can look back and go, well, I, I'm laughing about those ones. So mm-hmm. I know that the calm and then I don't need to be so heavy in the now moment, trusting that it's all for my benefit. It's all for possibly the benefit of others, whatever it is I'm going through. Yeah. And um, there'll be a time where I'll be looking back going, oh, that was really funny. That's actually quite funny. But um yeah, so f- finding a sense of humour, I think, is um, we don't maybe focus enough on that. I certainly haven't. So, mm, yeah, more pull your finger moments. Yeah, yeah, to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I really loved at the beach. I think you were there when we went to the beach um at the festival. And oh, what was Paul's pa- and Anna? Uh, oh, Paul's uh, pa- Aria, 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 Aria. Yeah. She got down the beach and she just was like frolicking. And he said, "This is what she does. She just." carries on like a child on the beach and I was like why aren't I doing that (laughs) you know she just had this real playfulness and this and um yeah maybe that's the trick is Mm. to get more of that to balance out all the other stuff yeah yeah absolutely Absolutely. Oh, Sky, I could talk to you all day. I know I actually could. Um, you're just Likewise. phenomenal. <laughs> um, I just love hanging out with you and I know we'll we'll hang out again more for sure. Um, so for people who are just loving you as much as I am and just um, maybe want to connect with you, is there any way that they can sort of reach out to you or anything like that? Or Yes, I, I do have an email. So is it best to um, give that in a link or do you want me to just say what it yeah, is now? Yeah, well, I can I can put it in the description if you want. Yeah, is that the best way? Um, yeah, I've people. got an email. I Yeah, I, my response times are not ideal at the moment, but I, I'm happy to, I will get back to people and I'm happy to connect that way. So mm-hmm. yeah, I would love to do that. Um, and I just want to say thank you as well, Narita, um, for modeling to me like just even um that weekend modeling to me that real spirit of sisterhood um just the way you were cheering for me and the way you cheered for everyone that week and you really got behind everyone and supported everyone I just thank you for that because that is the antidote to all of my sister stories that I'm leaving behind so and you inspire me to be more of that sister to others so um huge shout out to you and thanks for having me Oh, thanks, mate. Thank you so much. And right back at you. Bloody love you, woman. You're a champion. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, just look, thanks again, Sky, for being on the show. I so honour you. You're a beautiful soul and uh, I cannot wait to catch up with you again soon. Yeah, I might have to get on a plane and get to Adelaide, I reckon. Yeah, get down here, mate. Get down here. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome, awesome. All right. Thanks heaps.